Hey guys, how's it going? So, in the years that I've been doing videos on YouTube, I've done several about quadra jets. This is a four barrel Rochester quadra jet that's found on a lot of stuff. And it used to be it was found on everything from trucks and vans and cars and station wagons and stuff. And a lot of those cars are now, those vehicles are now kind of went out of existence. And mainly you'll find these now on people that cars that people have restored or kept original. Uh, motorhomes, some boats and things like that, trucks, some trucks. You, you don't see them as often. They're more of a kind of a um, vintage thing now. But all along since I've made those videos, I've gotten questions in my comment sections about different problems with these things. And they don't normally have a lot of problems. They're pretty simple carburetors. People that don't like them tend to say that they aren't, that they're too hard to understand, too hard to adjust and set up and this, that, and the other. It's just kind of whatever they want to say about them. I find them to be quite easy and I enjoy working on them. I, unfortunately, I really, I've been doing a lot of Mopar stuff in the last several years, so I really don't have a good vehicle to ever build one of these for and run on. I wish I did and that may change hopefully at some point, but for now, I have several that I've kept as builders and this is one of them this is for a 1970 oldsmobile 455 v8 non-stage one carburetor i found this one in a junkyard so one of the questions one of the subjects of the questions that i, I get a lot of is people that have problems with the secondary side of this carburetor and most of the time it was like a bog or something like that but I did a video that I think covered that pretty well, so that seems like that's helped people with that subject. But the other one that I get occasional questions about is what I want to do in this video, what I want to talk about. And that is if you have a quadra jet that will run fine on the front two barrels, never mind this has been disassembled, but the front two barrels, but when you try to kick in the the secondary is the secondary side of it and open it up, punch it, open it up, take off and go. It just won't run off the secondaries. As long as you have your foot in it, it just, just lays over and stutters and sputters and coughs and stumbles and just won't run. You let off the gas, it runs good. I've had that happen several times myself. Now, one thing to remember is you always need to, before you blame the carburetor, you always need to make sure that you have a good fuel pump and your line is good to the carburetor and you don't have problems in the tank. In other words, make sure that you're not just suffering from a general fuel starvation problem. Sometimes what I do, if it's feasible, is I take like a boat gas tank or some other source of fuel and, and just plumb that directly into the inlet side of the fuel pump so that I can test that I don't have an obstruction in the fuel line. Because I've had several cars, the older cars, that had problems in the fuel line, so you need to make sure that's not going on first. But if you have a carburetor issue, then I was going to show you some things here that I think will educate you as far as you know what to look for and what's what's what and what's going on. Because if you ever pull off the air horn on one of these carburetors, I'll agree with you that they're kind of they can be a little bit intimidating. So we pull the air horn off, and then you have these things sprouting off the bottom of it. So the two things in the middle, let's talk about those first. These two things here are the secondary metering rods. And get kind of close up maybe, when the camera will cooperate with us. You see how they're kind of a tapered rod? So what happens is these things normally, when the car is just running along on the front barrels, these things normally stay down in the secondary metering wells down here. If you look in the carburetor, you see right there, directly at three o'clock, right there beside my edge of my light, you see those two holes down in the bottom? That's the, that's where the jet, the, uh, the other, they're a lot permanent jets. They're not, you can't remove those, but those are where the secondary rods drop into. And what happens is, when you kick this thing in, you punch it. Now this one's got this old archaic Oldsmobile style, early style block for the secondary doors. But if when you punch that 
thing to the floor and it starts to open and it opens these air doors up then what happens is you see this thing in the middle see how it's let's do this sideways here i have to look at the camera and look at that both but you see how it's starting to lift there and do it several times for you and what happens is if you peek under here you can see it's lifting those rods up so that's kind of a coordinated thing there so it's got a little eccentric under here that this rides on but this is called a secondary rod hanger it's got a little screw that retains it you can take that screw off and pull that whole thing out and you can actually change these these and the secondary metering rods without ever taking the carburetor apart so that's this is just a little theory about how this works so you know for those people so oh, it's not easy to tune those well it looks pretty easy to me but you want to be careful about that because you don't want to go crazy but that's not really what we're going to worry about right now we're just looking at how this operates so this thing that pulls those secondary metering rods out of that and that allows fuel flow to the secondaries okay so get that cut out of the way so you pull the air doors open so when the, the bottom those throttle, the back throttle blades come open the air flow through it pulls them open so what happens is you have to have a fuel a pathway for fuel and so we've got these we've got this kind of a it, it looks a little intimidating until you know what it does but you have these tubes in here you have six tubes some of them may only have four, but this is kind of a high performance version, so they always usually have six. And so generally what we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna try to make this simple, is you have two tubes for primary pullover enrichment, you have two of them for secondary pullover enrichment, and you have two tubes that um, just are your fuel supply for the secondary side. Now, for the secondary discharge ports, which are these guys right here now, don't mind my pointing. We're going to talk about them specifically, so I may not point at the exact ones, what's what. So we're going to cover that in just a second. So what are we talking about when we talk about pullover enrichment? And why is it important to how this carburetor works? Well, pullover enrichment on a quadrajet. jet, if you took a look at this, we're looking from the front towards the rear. These carburetors, if you look carefully in here, you have a little port right here face in front here and here it's very tiny but it is connected to two of those tubes one tube here one tube there and what happens is when you you know you have an accelerator pump but you also when you wing this thing pretty hard the venturi effect when it's in rush air tends to pull just a little spritz of fuel out of that little port right there into the primaries and helps avoid a stumble so I'm going to see if I can remember which is which here. I think I know which is it. Let's see if I'm right here. So if I were to take my, if I were to take my carb cleaner to mimic fuel, see if I can get one of them to do that. See it? That's your pull, primary pullover enrichment. Now it doesn't do that all the time. It just does it when you have that drop, uh, when the, the throttle blades winged open. So that's primary pullover enrichment. So the magic about this is it also has, or the neat thing about it, maybe it's not magic, but I think it is, is Rochester also employs secondary pullover enrichment. We gotta get our camera where it will like us. Look there, you see, see those two ports right there? There's one here, and there's one here. That's secondary pullover enrichment, and we'll see again if I can duplicate that. So I'm going to use our my fuel source here, so to speak. Let's take a look here and see if we can make it do that. Almost. Oh, I have it. I have my thing twisted. Let's try it again. See that? So normally, the fuel is not normally under that kind of pressure. That's just a sort of a crude demonstration. That fuel doesn't flow under pressure. What happens is, is once again, when this air door, when you put your foot in it, when you plant it, 
you're just you're taking off fast or you got a motor home or something like that and you're having to pull a hill and you're getting into the four barrel when this air door starts to open i'm going to try to get you in kind of close here when that air door starts to open see what it's doing it pulls right past look at that it pulls right past that that port right there and so it pulls a little spritz of fuel out. Again, it doesn't flow continuously because what it's doing is you don't have an accelerator pump on the secondary side of this carburetor. So they're doing that to kind of make a like a uh, fill the gap between the time that you punch it and these air doors get all the way open. And this rod lift, this rod hanger, pulls the rods up to reach in the mix strip. So it's all meant to work together. So. That's how the secondary side works so far. That's your, your primary, well, we talked about primary, and that's your secondary pull-up wrench. But, but how does this thing get fuel, and what happens if it stops getting fuel, and what do you do about it? Okay, well, when we looked at these tubes here, you've got these outer tubes, this one, and this one, secondary pullover. I just sprayed stuff up this tube here. This big one up here is for your primary. But if you look right here, these two smaller ones and that's kind of funny that they are smaller but that's why they designed it i know guys are gonna be saying it's too small for that some of them tubes ought to be bigger than that for that but this is your secondary um uh, metering circuit right here and what this does is sits in a little well there and it draws fuel that has been passed around these rods here it pulls fuel up it comes up and it comes makes a turn right here and sprays out into the secondary bores of the carburetor on each side and that's the one that flows continuously that's one when you've got your foot all the way down on it that's where the fuel is coming through right here i've tried to do that but it's not really easy to spray that because there's something else you need to know about these two tubes here this one and this one but and that is is that they have bleeds on them the top of that tube is open now, I'll try to explain that. So right down the, that's not gonna work, is it? Let me get my handy dandy flashlight here. So if you look there, look where my thumbnail's pointing. You see that little, it looks like an end of a tube? Well, guess what that is? That's the end of a tube right there. So that's an air bleed open to the atmosphere and you may be wondering well why is that there if that's the fuel supply to the secondary side well it's there because they've designed this so it will pull enough fuel but they don't want it to have a siphon effect so the way that you have a you prevent a siphoning effect which means that once fuel starts flowing through this tube and out it may continue to do so when they don't need to is you you introduce Sort of you break the seal. It's almost like thinking of that, but that's the way you do it. Like if you were siphoning fuel or something through a, imagine if you were drinking something through a straw, like an ice, ice cold Dr. Pepper or something like that. Okay. If you have the straw and the straw is uh, continuous, no breaks in it, it's one solid straw, you can drain that cup immediately. Now it won't siphon because they just, it doesn't work like that but you have a nice suction effect on it. Okay, if you were to take like a head of a pen or something and just prick that thing, you would get a little bit of less flow on it, but you could still suck through it. So that's kind of the effect. That's not really maybe a good analogy, but that's the whole reason they do that. Not just this carburetor. They do that so that uh, it will not siphon. So anyway, the point is, what you've been waiting for is that, okay, what happens when it won't run off the secondaries? Well, that's real simple. You should have figured that out by now, I think, hopefully. These tubes are a press fit. These are, these are, the, these are, the, the, these are the two offenders right here, this one and this one. You want to get right in there and look? This one and this one. What happens is these things press in the air horn. They're brass tubes. You can't abuse them or manhandle them, so they press in you, you, gently. All right, take like a little rubber tip something and kind of push me out. All right, well, what happens is that thing won't run off the secondary. You try and try, it will not take the four barrel. That's what I used to say. So every time that happens, I open the air horn up and look, and I found at least one or both of those tubes 
laying down in the laying down in the carburetor. They fell out of the air horn. So that's critical information. If these tubes fall out, not this one or this one or this one, then it won't run as well because if one of these pullover enrichment tubes falls out, it'll still run, but you'll, you'll probably get like a little bit of a stumble. So, yeah, but if these two primary, um, secondary fuel supply tubes fall out, it will not run off the secondary side no matter what you do ever, or it will run poorly. If one of them falls out, it'll run poorly. If both of them fall out, it will not run. It'll just, bleh, it'll just lay over on its on its face. So that's what happens. That's a real simple thing. So I try to explain to people if they have that problem and they know that they're getting, they don't have a fuel supply issue from the tank or fuel pump or something like that, you're going to have to pull the top off this carburetor. It's not hard. You just, the way I do it is I always knock out this little pin right here with a carefully, careful, carefully chosen punch. Drive it in, pull this thing out, and then you have the rod that comes up from the choke. You disconnect it at the choke, and then you may have a vacuum brake too, but that choke, remember that choke rod goes down in the carburetor down here. I've been asked about this before too, but it goes down in here, and there's a little metal link in there which is not con permanently connected, so you have to kind of fool with it to get it connected back in there. If you look at it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And I always recommend pulling the top off that thing and seeing if the tubes are falling out. Because that's really, that's the only thing that can happen. That's a very simple secondary side of the carburetor. And I want to reiterate, I had the gentleman that contacted me a while back about some problems. And he was talking, he made mention of something. He said he's got his air doors, so they're partially open like that. So I guess something like that, he had the spring adjusted so loose they were just kind of sitting on, please don't do that because that throws off. When you, I explained to him, when you do that, then you have basically, you have deactivated this secondary pullover enrichment system. It won't work anymore because the air door's already up. And so we have to try to get ourselves past that when we're thinking that, well, the air doors need to be as loose as they can be. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't think like a guy on stuff like this, that looser and bigger is better and longer is better. Not always. So I, I always try to remind people that Rochester engineers knew what they were doing. Their goal in this was to make a carburetor that worked very, very well for many years, and they do. But they have to be set up the way the factory wanted them set up. Everything has to be intact. You have to not be taking linkages loose or bending them or putting in the wrong secondary rods and hangers and stuff like that. You know, carburetor tuning, no matter what carburetor, is an art, and we're not getting into that in this video. In fact, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I wouldn't even get into that before I had a vehicle to test one on. All right, guys, well, hopefully this is gonna be a useful video for you that uh, if you're having problems getting one of these to run exactly right when you're getting into it like that, maybe that'll help you. Now, we're not talking about a stumble that happens momentarily and then goes away and it runs good with your foot in it. We're talking about when you put your foot in it, it don't go. <laughs> it won't go anywhere, it won't run. It falls over on its face as long as you got your foot in it. If that's the case, you need to pull the top off the carburetor and look at these tubes. And if one of them's out, or both of them are out, just kinda, you can take a very minuscule amount of epoxy and kinda, you know, carefully don't get in the tubes because that'll screw it up for sure but you can tap those things back in. They don't normally fall out, but after many years, they are definitely capable of it. So please ask any questions you got, and I'll be glad to help you out with this. See you around, and thanks for watching.